The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Overcoming Challenges in the Treatment of Pediatric and Adult Patients with Uncontrolled Moderate to Severe Asthma, Comparing Approaches to the Use of Targeted Biologic Therapy with Experts Around the World. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerreview.com forward slash AGP860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So welcome to the third episode of this uh, educational activity. Uh, in this episode, we will we'll try to give answer to these questions. How do you treat uncontrolled moderate to severe asthma in pediatric and adult patients around the world? And we will compare our approaches uh, between our faculty. Uh, as you may know that the biologics are indicated for the selected patients with asthma uncontrolled angina step 4 and 5 therapy. And we have biomarkers like phenol, IgE, eosinophil, so that can identify the presence or absence of T, t helper uh, T2 uh, inflammation. And we they can guide us to select the biologics. When you look at this table, you can see that we have six biologics here with the targets of them, like IL-4, 13 for DUPI, IgE for omelizumab, uh, IL-5R for beralizumab, uh, IL-5, IL-5 both for mepolizumab and reslizumab, and TSLP for tezepelumab. You can see the age ranges, and uh, it is possible to use dupilumab and omenizumab over six years, and MEPO as well. And, and for the other biologics, we have an age limit of 12 and 18 for reslizumab. And the frequency is also important for some patients. You can choose according to the frequency of the doses. And also, uh, I would like to uh, underline that there may be comorbidities that you need to treat with the same biologics. So take into account of these uh, uh, indications, approved indications, where in dupilumab, a uh, patient can have atopic dermatitis or chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposits uh, or perigo nodularis and omenizumab, chronic spontaneous urticaria and nasal polyposis, and for MIPA, ECPA, S, and chronic rhinositis. So these are the factors that we should take into account while choosing a biologic uh, for a patient. And uh, the efficacy and the safety of biologics are important, and we have enough data showing us that uh, from the multiple clinical studies, quality of life increases, exacerbations decreases, ER visit decreases, hospitalization decreases, and most importantly, steroid requirement decreases. And when we come to the safety issues, we have a very low incidence of side effects in tri trials, like uh, less than 3%, including minor ones like headache, nasopharyngitis, injection site reactions mostly, or ocular effects, or very, very rare anaphylactic reactions. For the factors uh, impacting biologic therapy selection, I would like to summarize this. Uh, maybe then uh, afterwards we can discuss with the other faculty members how can we uh, select which one is more important. To me, uh, the first one is the availability and accessibility of the drug in that uh, country because uh, being a GINA uh, faculty, we have traveled a lot to low- and middle-income countries. They never had so biology. So uh, accessibility is so important. Patient characteristics so important. Uh, as Klaus mentioned, phenotyping and endotyping so important. Comorbidities, as I have mentioned, because we have some uh, indications for other comorbidities for these biologics. Long-term safety and efficacy profile. Adherence considerations because of the self-administrations, office visits, this is important. Frequency of dosing is also important. Route of administration sometimes differ from patient to patient. Uh, and of course, clinicians' experience is important. Uh, as we have mentioned before, 
uh, we have the most experience with Omenizumab because this is the uh, first uh, biologics we have and we had the long-term experience for that. And also we are having, we are trying to have uh, new experiences with the uh, new drugs. Same case, a uh, 35-year-old one, uh, woman uh, diagnosed in her 20s, two exacerbations within the past year requiring oral corticosteroids, and she's on daily ICS lava lama therapy, and she's using bronchodilator as necessary. Uh, she has a normal weight, uh, and uh, I think uh, we can consider this patient as a candidate for a biologic therapy. What, which one? And we are considering steroid sparing options. We are trying to improve her life, her quality of life, and we need to evaluate for comorbidities. And uh, is she eosinophilic, allergic, elevated pheno? So which one uh, would you choose for the biologic therapy for the patient in this case? Klaus, may I ask you first, and then I will ask uh, Len for uh, if the patient were a child, what would he do? Yes, thank you, Azu. Thank you also for the presentation. I think we need to be aware that globally, not everyone, I think a lot of individuals do not regularly measure NO levels. I think as a comment, but um, given the question about the three IgE, pheno, and eosinophils, I would think that someone that is in fact exacerbating like who, like she is, and she not needs oral corticosteroids. In fact, I think one of my aims would be to solve that problem as quickly as possible, um, and to get rid of the oral corticosteroids. And in that sense, I would think that if she was um, type two inflammation, eosinophilic high, pheno high. I would think I would go for an anti R4, R13 strategy. Also for the second point, she was complaining that she needed so much rescue medication because I would think that her lung function improvement would be advisable. So with bronchodilator therapy, she was not doing very well. And again, there, the biggest effect on lung function has been shown with R4, R13. So I would go for that. But basically, I think she's a very good example of that you have different choices you can make based on biomarkers and her clinical presentation. And what would guide me would be her oral corticosteroid use as a young woman. And secondly, the, 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 the high need of bronchodilator. So I would like to do something for a lung function as well. That would be my considerations. Thank you. Very good points. Lan, any talks in regard to the updated results from Liberty Asthma Voyage and about the use of the DUPI in children? Sure, I'll I'll, I'll sort of add on to what Klaus mentioned because I think many of the the thought processes are identical. Um, you know, we don't have specifics presented for this case in terms of her allergic status, her eosinophil count, um, her pheno status, or her FEV one. So we're we're forced to make a, a series of assumptions, right? Um, in in childhood, we are highly focused on two major elements. Um, one is exacerbation prevention and oral corticosteroid stewardship, and an effort to minimize any patient's exposure to systemic corticosteroids, which do have cumulative long-term side effects that I think we are only beginning to fully appreciate. Um, the second is the optimization of lung function, um, because we know that lung function relates to exacerbation risk. It almost certainly reflects long-term lung growth, and as, as we age, it's a, ref, a predictor of all-cause morbidity and mortality. So optimization of lung function, I think, is, is another um, essential element. Um, and when we think about those and we think about the, the, the agents that are available by age group, um, by biomarkers, this child, if this were a child, would probably qualify for multiple because these tend to be overlapping phenotypes. When we look at their ability to prevent exacerbations, they're reasonably comparable. There's a range, um, but 
but they're all sort of in the 50 to 60% range. But when we look at lung function improvement, dupilumab has been the one that has shown the most consistent and substantial improvements in lung function. And I think um, given its importance in the management of severe disease in childhood, that is often to me a determining factor as to which um, biologic I would choose. The other point is that in children, we often see um, substantial atopic comorbidity, such as atopic dermatitis, eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, and in those cases, choosing a biologic that would impact multiple diseases simultaneously provides the patient with multiple um, condition improvement um, without additional medication, and in often cases, less medication overall. So I think you know, understanding the, the full scope of, of comorbid and coexisting type 2 conditions might also influence how I would choose um, between the biologics in this case. Thank you. Thank you both. I think we have succeeded to give a frame to our colleagues to, while they are choosing the biologics, and this patient was a good one to uh, talk on. Uh, so I think we came to the uh, end of the episode uh, three, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash AGP 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals.